What's good, YouTube? It's me, Bro Squid, back in another Squid Ale. Let's talk about how to beat the Voiceless deck. This is a very, very annoying deck that's evidently top three in the current metagame, the tier zero format that we have, shared between the Snake Eyes and the Snake Eyes Fire King decks. I would say third in line is probably Voiceless, and this deck actually is quite scary to deal with because your Skull Guardian is an Omni Negate monster that also cannot be targeted or basically destroyed because he goes to 4100 attack while you control a low or the lows in their graveyard. And when they have these two monsters on the board, yes, Skull Guardian once per turn can negate and destroy a card, and they also have infinite protection. You know, they have potentially an Old Man Cerebus on the field that can then return itself to the hand to summon out a Cerebus who can then negate the summons from your hand or your graveyard or wherever that's uh, basically not inherent summon and when they have barrier you cannot target any of their light monsters and you can only target the ritual monsters for attacks which makes it really difficult to destroy low and turn off the skull guardian of course to add to that they play a lot of hand traps and better yet also the trap card radiance of the voiceless voice this allows them to during the main phase either shuffle back a light ritual monster or a ritual spell from their hand or grave to special summon a voiceless voice monster from their deck or better yet, they can target cards that their opponent controls up to the number of light ritual monsters. So if they have a Skull Guardian and a Cerevis, that means two cards on the field, and then they can pop it alongside the Radiance. So this is just a lot of disruptions when you add hand traps to the mix. Let's talk about how to defeat them with hand traps, starting off at the top, none other than Ash Blossom and Joy Spring. This is one of the most devastating cards against this deck because everything basically adds or summons from deck, right? You guys already seen kind of these cards that we have so far. They all do a lot of adding. Personally, I would be inclined to Ash Blossom the first thing that they actually use to add in this deck, whether that's something like a Sephira Dragon Queen, which allows them to discard herself and add a ritual uh, light warrior monster or dragon from their deck to their hand, or if they start off with a high impact card like pre prep of Rights, that's definitely something you want to Ash. Now, why would you Ash something that they do immediately first when there's a chance that they could have something higher impact to Ash? Well, it's because of the existence of Drone Lockbird, which means that if you're playing Voices Voice, you generally want to play around Drone Lockbird, meaning that you want to use your first search to be the most highly impactful search that allows you to play in case the opponent it has Drone Lockbird, right? So we're kind of looking at an odd situation where Drone Lockbird is kind of keeping this deck in check, even though it doesn't necessarily have to be in your deck or your side deck against this deck, but the fact that there's a fear of this card existing means that they are going to use a searcher as their first option, the best searcher in their hand, so they can play around it. So that's why you should always ash something like a Sephira, you should ash pre-prep, even cards like Nadir Servant, and potentially even a card like the Diviner of the Herald, the effect you send, because then you can just stop them from sending the Trias, and then they tribute off the Diviner of the Herald, which is one of their starters. Diviner triggers in the graveyard to special summon a level two or lower fairy monster, in this case, low directly from the deck, and then they just start playing. So that's why you should always ash the first thing. Drone Lockbird makes it so they're always going to be ashing. Um, Drone Lockbird makes it so they're always going to be using the first high impact search, and they're not actually going to be bluffing. Same thing with Pot of Prosperity is another card. If they're starting with Pot for six, I am ashing that 100%. So here you guys know what to ash. Next is Effect Veiler, Infinite Impermanence, and Ghost Mourner. Well, these cards are also highly effective against this deck because obviously you can hit their normal summon starter. So whether that's Diviner or something like a normal summon low, you definitely want to hit that immediately. Obviously, Ghost Mourner is a little bit slow to that boat because we're not going to be able to hit a normal summon monster. It can only hit the special summon creatures. So you would probably reserve that for something like a Skull Guardian. Now, there are certain lines where they actually summon out the Skull Guardian first by tributing a low or something else. I would definitely still Valor or Imperm that because if they're triggering low in the graveyard, the minute low hits the table, that means Skull Guardian is going to have a negate. So our effect Valor is going to be useless for the rest of that turn. Yes, they do have cards like Cerevis that can counteract these targeting effects, but we just have to chance that they actually have the Cerevis. And either way, it gets it out of the hand. So that's oftentimes pretty good. So on our turn, we might have another Imperm or something and we can try and target assuming they don't have the barrier up but you know just play as if they didn't have Cerebus because if they don't you're going to be ahead if they do you know they had it anyways and of course if they do summon out Skull Guardian first I would definitely Valor or Imperm or Ghost Mourner this just so they cannot search a copy of a Voiceless Voice monster which uh, this card actually allows you to do on the summon it's pretty crazy it does a lot of stuff T typically they just go for the Cerebus Dragon Sage of the Voiceless Voice and then they can establish Dragon Sage which means on your turn Dragon Sage's effect can be used to recycle itself back to the hand to special out a Cerebus 
from the deck, right? So we don't want them to get to that line. One less ritual monster on the bo uh, body on the field means that we're going to be able to summon something like a Black Witch if you're playing like a Snake Eyes deck through Cerebus. And better yet, the trap card's only gonna be able to pop one card as opposed to two, which could be a game-breaking difference, right? So... Yeah, that's what you should Valor. Uh, Troll Lockbird is actually a very, very powerful card against this deck. It's not very good in the format right now because Snake Eyes just can play around it so easily, especially if they start with the Snake Eye Ash. You're kind of looking at an end board still through Droll. But against Voiceless, a lot of times it can actually be turn ending if they start off with something like a Sephir Dragon Queen, add something, and then they don't have the other combination to actually ritual summon, then that could be highly devastating. But a lot of times Droll can actually be quite terrible as well because we kind of talked about the Voiceless voice player expecting Droll. So they're going to use their first search as the most highly impactful searcher that likely allows them to play. Like this deck has a lot of starters or combinations of two cards that allow them to play, right? So there's a high chance that after using their initial search, they're actually still going to be able to ritual summon out a Skull Guard. Guardian, and as long as they have the Skull Guardian and the low on the board, they still have the Omni Negate up, then they're kind of in a good spot. They don't have to search for Skull Guardian, right? So that's just one thing that's really, really scary with Drone Lockford. Sometimes it could backfire, and then you kind of have to still stare down a Skull Guardian and deal with it, especially in Game 2 and Game 3 when they're going first, and they side in Floodgates, like Summon Limit, and they're back behind a Skull Guardian, and we just lost a card out of our hand. We're just like, oh, crap. This is going to be a hard board to break with five cards, right? We're drawing the fifth card per turn. So I don't think it's amazing against this deck, but I still think it's quite good because you can actually catch them off guard. So if you're already siding draw, I would definitely bring it in, but I would not say it's the best choice against this deck. Ghost Bell and Haunted Mansion, on the other hand, is a card that I actually think is highly effective against this deck. If you guys haven't read the fine print on the Voices cards, a lot of them also add from the graveyard to the hand in addition to the deck. So Dragon Queen Sephira actually can add from the deck or graveyard, meaning we can actually use Ghost Bell on it even if they don't have a card in the graveyard. Yes, cards like this in Nadir Servant are ruled that even if there's no card on the activation in the graveyard that they could nab back to their hand, on the resolution, there's a chance that there could be a card, right? Like, they could chain Twin Twisters, discarding a target, and then on the resolution of Nadir Servant or resolution of Sapphire, they can add back that target from the grave. So the game mechanics actually recognizes this and says, yeah, you know what? You can actually use Ghost Spell on Nadir Servant or Dragon Queen, even if there are no targets in the grave. There are some other things that also work out of the graveyard, like pre-prep of rights. A lot of people don't actually realize that this card can actually add the ritual monster from the deck or the graveyard to the hand. So we can actually go spell this as well, even if they have an empty graveyard. Same sort of effect applies there. If they're going for something ballsy, like the Dynamundo play, which tributes itself for cost to resurrect a ritual monster from the graveyard, typically they would resurrect back a Skull Guardian. Skull Guardian doesn't trigger to add, but they can actually trigger the low effect in the graveyard because this can trigger whenever they special summon a light ritual monster doesn't have to be an actual ritual summon monster so that means that if you have the ghost bell on dynamundo it's very very powerful this is why a lot of voiceless voice players will actually anticipate that and they're definitely not going to make dynamundo game two or game three unless they absolutely have to because ghost bell is just like game winning shot right there but this is just like something to know because sometimes they do make the dynamundo and you can just do that also even the radiance of the voiceless voice this card does the first effect it shuffles back a ritual monster or ritual spell from the hand of the graveyard so you can actually go spell this one thing to note is that they actually flip up this continuous trap card and they decide whether or not to use the effect on the activation now if they actually choose to use the first effect on the initial flip up activation of the card then you can go spell that and it actually negates the activation so radiance sends itself to the graveyard because it doesn't consider itself as activated and resolved on the field so that's one thing to know but if they flip up radiance and the activation they say i'm not activating the effect immediately and then they activate the first effect on the later chain yes you can still go spell that but then radiance would stay on the board so that's an important distinction to actually make when you're playing ghost spell it's a very very niche thing but it's very important to know because radiance being in the grave or on the field could just make the game uh be in your favor or in your opponents right so that's one thing to note there but ghost spell is a very very good card against this deck DD Crow is another decent card against this deck. There's so many things that trigger out of the graveyard. We talked about low resurrecting itself from the graveyard. This is something that you can hit with DD Crow. So then, boom, low goes away, which means Skull Guardian goes back to its 2050 attack. Also, it does not have the Omni Gate effect, which is especially important. There are also other cards you can nab out of the graveyard. There are, for example, you know, maybe the. Uh, 
Reminder of the Herald. So when they send the Trias and they actually use the effect of Trias to tribute the Diviner as a cost, this is a lot like the Cyber Angel Benten rulings that we kind of had in the old days before it was errata, that if you actually tribute something as cost and your opponent chains DD Crow targeting the monster that you tributed as cost, because it's no longer in the graveyard anymore after the resolution, it can no longer trigger. So in our case, they'll go Diviner of the Herald, send Trias, Trias effect chain link one, sending the Diviner to the graveyard as a cost, tribute. We can chain DD Crow, chain link to target the actual diviner, banish that diviner, which means it's banished. So on the resolution of the chain, diviner is not going to be able to activate to summon out the low from the deck. This is just something that's really, really uh, kind of heads up that you can just shut off the uh, diviner, which is nuts because Dita Crow normally would not do that, right? And there's some other cards you can hit as well. Even the Prayers of the Voiceless Voice, this is just like a spell card that chills in their graveyard. That actually has another effect a lot of people forget about. It says, if a face-up light ritual monster you control leaves the field by an opponent's card effect, you can banish this card from your graveyard, special summon a Cerevis or Skull Guardian directly from your hand or your deck, ignoring the summoning conditions. So yes, if you're using something like a Super Polymerization on the Skull Guardian and the low, and they have the ritual spell in the graveyard, they can banish it, summon out another Skull Guardian from the deck, low will trigger in the graveyard, and boom, you're back to square one like they just have the negates and the full board set up again so this is just one thing that you could definitely do to crow it's not going to be the best feeling in the world but if you're staring down at prayers and you're trying to otk and break through the board and you absolutely have to this is something else you can hit dd crow just has a lot of flexibility so it's definitely a card you can side in against this deck Skullmeister is a bit of a niche one. I know there's a meme going on that I always bring this up because he has level 4 and 1700 attack, but this card could actually see some usage against this deck because a lot of things trigger a grave. Low triggers in grave, and also Sephira triggers in grave, allowing you to ritual summon by banishing herself from the graveyard. Yes, you can obviously need to curl this before they use the effect, but better yet, you could wait for them to use the effect and then Skullmeister it because it's a hard once per turn. So this is something that makes Skullmeister slightly better in that regard. There are also other things you can uh, hit as well. Obviously, the Diviner of the Herald in the graveyard. This time, we can chain directly to it instead of having to DD Crow preemptively. Also, they uh, can send other things with Diviner. It doesn't have to be Trace. It could be uh, Elder Entity Entis to try and pop a Floodgate. It could be Herald of the Arclight as well. So these are other cards you can kind of hit with the Skullmeister if you are um, lucky about it and you actually see the Skullmeister in time. But again, this is just another card you can consider. I think it goes without saying that Dimensional Shifter is absolutely bonkers against a deck like this that's heavily graveyard dependent. So if you're playing like a Cast Hero or Flunderies deck with D Shifter, definitely bring them in because this card is auto win a lot like how it was against Sinful Spoil Snake Eye, but probably more so against this deck because they really rely on the graveyard hard. The Biss deals are also just as good. You've seen a lot of pro players actually citing these at the uh, Premier YCS events in the past couple of weeks because these cards are highly effective against other decks like Branded as well. There's some crossover, and the fact that you get a body is especially powerful in the right deck because you can easily link climb into anything and start triggering their effects, right? Like Dark, SP Little Knight, there are a lot of options. Having a body on the board with 2,500 attack is also very, very crucial for pushing through boards. And of course, you can obviously banish the low out of the graveyard so they don't trigger that effect. Or better yet, you could also banish the Sapphira so they just cannot ritual summon, period, and try and play around your Bistils potentially if they have multiple lows. There's just a lot of other light and dark monsters in the format generally that you can banish with the Bistils. I know some players were actually citing it for the Simple Spoils Mirror Match because that Mirror Match has so many hand traps slinging around that it becomes very grindy. So at the end of the turn, they could just use it on the Link Karibu, banish the Link Karibu, summon out a Bistil and have a body on board. And it can also shut off certain things like Borolold Savage Dragon because this has to target a Link monster generally. They are targeting the Link Karibu, you chain, and then they do not gain the counters. So then that just deals with a negate and we get a body on board and we get rid of the Link Karibu. So there's a lot of crossover with these cards. I think they're actually decently good to side in general, and they just happen to be very powerful against other decks like Branded and also Voiceless Voice. Ghost Ogre is another card that can also hit the deck. You can obviously hit their continuous spell card, which is probably the number one enemy there, just preventing them from resolving that search. There's also the trap card as well, Radiance, depending on how they use this. Now, if they use the effect upon the flip of the card, then you're not going to be able to Ghost Ogre because this is not treated as a continuous spell trap card that's already been on the field but if it's already face up on the field which most of the time it is because it's placed off of the effect of low and then try to trigger the effect we can just easily ghost over that so it has a lot of usage i quite like this card
card. It does a lot against the other format cards as well, like Fire King Island. Just when they don't play Sanctuary and you nail an island, it's just game breaking. It can obviously hit IP Mask Arena as well and Appaloosa because Appaloosa is only once per chain. So chaining it in response to Appaloosa deals with that problem as well. There's a lot of utility for this little card. And I think, you know, it's a little bit underrated right now, but in the right deck, it could definitely shine. Now, here's some other options. Just Cosmic Cyclone is obviously a decent one going first and second because going second, you can snipe the Radiance of the Voiceless Voice, get that out of rotation so they're not popping anything or special summoning anything out, or better yet, bait the Skull Guardian Negate if they're forced to actually respond to it, which is fine. I'll trade a 1,000 life points to negate your Skull Guardian. Why not? There's also the Radiance and the Barrier of the Voiceless Voice. When you go first, you can respond to the Barrier, and sometimes that can be very, very crucial against this deck. Guys, this deck is oftentimes, they do not have a lot of one-card starters. Basically, their only one-card starters are Diviner of the Herald and a normal summon low. Everything else requires two or more cards in order to get the Skull Guardian plus low into rotation. So hitting them one for one trade with hand traps or with cards like Cosmic Cyclone is oftentimes very devastating and I actually quite like these cards a lot. Or better yet, you can actually play Typhoon. This is a card that we actually played in our YCS Las Vegas 3v3 team. If you guys remember, this card is highly effective against Fire King Island because at the end of their turn, you can actually use it and pop everything. You can also use it on IP Mask Arena, which is very powerful against the pure Snake Eyes deck. Now, the application against rogue decks is especially important. This card can hit so many things that are rogue. Uh, we used it to hit my friend purely as well against purely decks. And then better yet, in this deck, you can actually hit a lot of the face-up cards. So again, the barrier of the voiceless voice. Now, a lot of times they might have this as their only face-up spell card, so you can't immediately use Typhoon, but going second, it still has a lot of application because you can hit the Radiance of the Voiceless Voice and it just acts as more cards to get rid of that. And then game two, game three, you just get rid of the Summon Limit, which is one of their main go first cards that allows them to win because Summon Limit back behind a Negate is just impossible to get rid of. And having an extra out or an extra six copies of outs if you play three Cosmic and three Typhoon is just so nice against Summon Limit on top of hitting their engine cards like Radiance that I think Typhoon is actually a really, really solid option right now that a lot of people are underlooking. And I've seen a lot of people actually pick it up for regionals and do quite well with it so yeah guys shout out to those guys that are actually playing this card i think it's actually putting in a lot of work and people are underestimating it not a lot of people are playing cross out designator for this card i don't think anyone is so it can't be cross outed either it's just like niche applications can't be triple that because talent because it's not a uh, monster card as well so a lot of cool niche interactions in the format that makes it a lot better than it actually seems there are a lot of board breakers opportunities as well. So playing Harpy's Feather Duster and Lightning Stormer, I think are decently good. Now, if they're actually a voiceless voice player and that's decently good, they'll put all their stuff in defense mode because that plays around cards like Hida crashing anyways. So Lightning Storm might not actually address the monsters, but if they do have attack position monsters, it just deals with the negate. And then on the spell trap lineup dealing with Radiance and potentially the summon limit at the same time is just huge, right? So these blanket wipe cards, Harpy's Feather Duster, are just really, really powerful Lightning Storm as well. Now moving on to the go first cards. A lot of people are citing Summon Limit. Is this card good against Voices? Personally, I don't really think so because they can easily set up their board with two or less summons, but I could see you bringing it in because it's not guaranteed they can actually do it under two summons. A lot of times they do have to do multiple summons. If they're summoning out a low as a normal summon, then activating a ritual spell to ritual summon Skull Guardian, that's already two summons. Them trying to bring back low, you can just chain Summon Limit and kind of deal with that. And also the Diviner line also is more than two summons as well. I just don't really like Summon Limit. I don't think it's that strong against the control deck but it definitely can be brought in i don't think it's like absolutely terrible but it's probably mid dimensional barrier is obviously a huge one this card is just auto win all rituals yeah there's not a lot this deck can do luckily for them not a lot of players are playing dimensional barrier because it happens to do nothing against snake eye but this is also good against branded and it's also good against voices so against like these kind of rogue strategies, it's just auto win. So if you guys like to uh, address these concerns, if you have a heavy meta game with a lot of rogue decks, then D-Barrier should definitely go in your side deck going first. Anti-Spell Fragrance is also another card that easily deals with this deck because it shuts off all spell cards. But again, they do have one out, and that's actually Divine of the Herald. So remember to Imperm or Veiler this because if they send the Elder Entity in Tis, they are going to pop your Anti-Spell Fragrance. A lot of people see the Diviner and they're like, oh, they're going to summon, uh, send the Trias or the, the, the Herald. I'm fine with that. Nope, they send the Entis and then you lose your Anti-Spell and you lose the game. So that's just one thing to note. But other than that, they don't have a lot of outs and all of their spell cards are normal spell cards. So dealing with it is very, very nice in one card called Anti-Spell Fragrance. Guys, that's about all I had for the Voiceless Voice Squidio. What do you think? Are there any cards we're missing that are actually good against this deck? And what do you guys think about the deck so far in the format? Let us know in the comments below. Other than that, thanks a lot for tuning in. We'll see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.